Hello and welcome back to my vlog, The Greatest Thing in the World by Henry Drummond, Part 5. Some of us have not much time to lose. Remember, once more, that this is a matter of life or death. I cannot help speaking urgently for myself, for yourselves. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That is to say, it is the deliberate verdict of the Lord Jesus that it is better not to live than not to love. It is better not to live than not to love. Guileness and sincerity may be dismissed almost without a word. Guilelessness is the grace for suspicious people. The possession of it is the greatest secret of personal influence. You will find, if you think for a moment, that the people who, inf who influence you are people who believe in you. In an atmosphere of suspicion, men shrivel up. But in that atmosphere, they expand and find encouragement and educative fellowship. It is a wonderful thing that here and there in this hard, uncharitable world, there should still be left a few rare souls who think no evil. This is the great unworldliness. Love thinketh no evil, imputes no motive, sees the bright side, puts the best construction on every action. What a delightful state of mind to live in. What a stimulus and benediction even to meet with it for a day. To be trusted is to be saved. And if we try to influence or elevate others, we shall soon see that success is in proportion to their belief of our belief in them. The respect of another is the first restoration of the self-respect a man has lost. Our ideal of what he is becomes to him the hope and pattern of what he may become. Love rejoiceth, rejoiceth not in unrighteousness, but rejoiceth with the truth. I have called this sincerity from the words rendered in the authorized version by rejoiceth in the truth. And certainly, were this the real translation, nothing could be more just. For he who loves will love truth not less than men. He will rejoice in the truth. Rejoice not in what he has, but rejoice not in what he has been taught to believe, not in this church's doctrine or in that, not in this ism or in that ism, but in the truth. He will accept only what is real. He will strive to get at facts. He will search for truth with a humble and unbiased mind and cherish whatever he finds at any sacrifice. But the more literal translation of the Revised Version calls for just such a sacrifice for truth's sake here. For what Paul really meant is, as we there read, rejoiceth not in unrighteousness, unrighteousness but rejoiceth with the truth. A quality which probably no one English word, and certainly not sincerity, adequately defines. It includes, perhaps more strictly, the self-restraint which refuses to make capital out of others' faults, the charity which delights not in exposing the weakness of others, but covereth all things, the sincerity of purpose which endeavors to see things as they are and rejoices to find them better than suspicion feared or calumny denounced. So much for the analysis of love. Now the business of our lives is to have these things fitted into our characters. That is the supreme work to which we need to address ourselves in this world, to learn love. If li is life not full of opportunities for learning love? Every man and woman every day has a thousand of them. The world is not a playground, it is a schoolroom. Life is not a holiday, but an education. And the one eternal lesson for, for us all is how better can we love? What makes a man a good cricketer? Practice. What makes a man a good artist, a good sculptor, a good musician? Practice. What makes a man a good linguist, a good stenographer? Practice. What makes a man a good man? Practice. Nothing else. There is nothing capricious about religion. We do not get the soul in different ways, under different laws from those in which we get the body and the mind. If a man does not exercise his arm, he develops no biceps muscle. And if a man does not exercise his soul, he acquires no muscle in his soul, no strength of character, no vigor of moral fiber, no beauty of spiritual growth. Love is not a thing of enthusiastic emotion. It is a rich, strong, manly, vigorous expression of the whole round Christian character, the Christ-like nature in its fullest development. And the constituents of this great character are only to be built up by ceaseless practice. 
What was Christ doing in the carpenter's shop? Practicing. Though perfect, we read that he learned obedience and grew in wisdom and in favor with God. Do not quarrel, therefore, with your lot in life. Do not complain of its never-ceasing cares, its petty environment, the vexations you have to stand, the small and sordid souls you have to live and work with. Above all, do not resent temptation. Do not be perplexed, because it seems to thicken round you more and more, and ceases neither for effort, nor for agony, nor prayer. That is your practice. That is the practice which God appoints you, and it is having its work in making you patient, and humble, and generous, and unselfish, and kind, and courteous. Do not grudge the hand that is molding the still too shapeless image within you. It is growing more beautiful, though you see it not, and every touch of temptation may add to its perfection. Therefore keep in the midst of life. Do not isolate yourself. Be among men and among things, and among troubles and difficulties and obstacles. You remember Goethe's words, talent develops itself in solitude, character in the stream of life. Talent develops itself in solitude. The talent of prayer, of faith, of meditation, of seeing the unseen, character grows in the stream of the world's life. That, chiefly, is where men are to learn love. So go out and spread love today. That's your way to make it a great day. And bye for now.